Hi, this is week 12 of AP Physics and in this lesson we will cover Kepler's laws as well as we're going to talk about how to derive equations. So let's talk about our lesson objectives. For our objective it says students will understand the relationship between mass, distance and gravitational force. Next, students will be able to use the concepts learned from gravitational force and apply them to Kepler's laws. And finally, we'll be able to use Newton's laws to derive new equations. Let's get started. So we're going to start with a little bit of history on Kepler, Kepler's law. So it says, in the 2nd century AD, Greek astronomer Claudius Ptolemy developed a geocentric model, which stated that Earth was at the center of the universe and everything else circled around us. It was not until 1543 that Polish astronomer Nicholas Copernicus showed that the planets in the solar system circled around the sun, and this is referred to as the heliocentric model. Now, Danish astronomer Tycho Bahe uh, made accurate astronomical measurements over a period of 20 years. His assistant, German astronomer Johannes Kepler, used Bahe's data to deduce the mathematical model for the motion of planets. This process took 16 years. Kepler concluded that the planets traveled in elliptical orbits and not circular orbits, as Copernicus had stated. Now, here's Kepler's first law states that planets move in elliptical orbits with the Sun at one of the focal points. So here's one focal point, there's the other one, and we have our elliptical orbit, as you see right there. Uh, here's our planet in this picture, Sun right there, so it's one, uh, one of the focal points, that's where you will find the Sun. The other point is that imaginary point in space. Now the time it requires a planet to complete one orbit around the Sun, that's referred to as the period. And the symbol for period is uppercase T, not to, not to be confused with time, which is a lowercase t. So Kepler's second law says a line is drawn from the sun to any planet, and then it sweeps out equal areas in equal time intervals. So let's take a look at this picture right here. So we have the sun right here, and you have a planet. Let's say that this planet travels 30 days from here to there. So this area that is not created is the same area as another as the same planet traveling the same length of time 30 days on this other part of the sun so even though they don't look the same it is the same area all right what is the reason for that well the reason for that is well if you look at this uh, treat it as a triangle the it's got a very wide base but a very small height so you get the area which is one half base times height for this one, it's got a very small base, but a very tall height, so it does balance out. So that area that is swept over the same amount of time is the same, regardless of where it is around the orbit. Now, how fast is the speed of this planet? Well, that's calculated using this formula. <coughs> Excuse me. V equals 2 pi r over t. All right, so this formula is just for the speed of the planet, it's really just the distance it traveled, which is the circumference of a circle, so there's the formula for circumference, divided by the time it takes to complete one revolution, one loop around, so that is known as the period. Okay, so that's a formula for the speed of a planet as it goes around the sun. Now, Kepler's third law says the square of the orbital period of any planet is proportional to the cube of the average distance from the planet to the Sun. So we have this formula right here, T again is the orbital period, the time to complete one revolution, and it is the cube, uh, if you cube the radius and multiply times 4 pi squared over G times M, where G is the universal gravitational constant, which is 6.67 times 10 to negative 11, Newton's times meters squared over kilograms squared. Multiply times here in the denominator the m, and then here they have the s for the sun. In this picture, they have the sun in the center, so it's the mass of the sun, so that's why you see that s. In other problems you're going to solve, solve later on, we're going to go ahead and have uh, a satellite circling around the planet Earth. So you might see m, e, e for Earth. So the mass of what the body that is at the center that is what goes here where the uppercase M is located. Alright, so that is our formula. So we have here the velocity and here is for the period of the planet. Alright, if time is measured in Earth years and the distance is calculated in astronomical units, 
by the way, an astronomical unit is the distance from planet Earth to the Sun. So that is one astronomical unit. So the distance from Earth to the Sun. And then Kepler's law, this one right here, can be simplified a little bit into this formula right here. We have t squared, which is the orbital period squared is equal to the astronomical units to the third power. So that's just a simplification of the formula. All right, so let's go ahead and move along. The next slide, pardon me, is this table, table 7.3. While solving some of the problems, this, uh, you'll need to refer to this table. Now this table in your book in 7.3 will have a lot of the values that you need. For example, for all the planets and our sun as well, it's going to go ahead and have their mass, their mean radius, the orbital period, and mean distance from the sun, and um, all sorts of uh, useful information that you're going to need as you go ahead and solve some of these problems. So keep that table handy. For example three, we're asked the following question. It says, from a telecommunications point of view, it is advantageous for satellites to remain at the same location relative to a location on Earth. This can occur only if the satellite's orbital period is approximately 24 hours, which is the same as the rotation of the planet Earth. So in part A they say, at what distance from the center of the Earth can this geosynchronous orbit be found? And in part B, what is the orbital speed of the satellite? Alright, so this is what we're looking for. So we have planet Earth right here, and we have our satellite. And uh, what we want our satellite to do is, we want it to go ahead and stay over the same spot okay, as it orbits planet Earth. So as Earth spins around this axis, which takes about, about 24 hours, we want the satellite to go ahead and complete well, one orbital revolution around the Earth in about the same amount of time. So if they're both spinning at the same rate, therefore the satellite stays over the same spot the whole time. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to go ahead and use this formula right here to figure out the radius. How far away from the center of the planet is this satellite? So, let's go ahead and get to work on that. Uh, so, if we're looking for the radius, I'm going to get that formula. I'm going to modify it slightly so that way we can just isolate the R. So, I'm going to go ahead and do that. So, I'm going to rewrite the formula slightly. Pi times R cube over G times mass of Earth. Okay, so what am I going to do? I want to isolate this R. So I'm going to begin by multiplying both sides by universal constant and the mass of the Earth. What I do to one side, I got to do to the other. So that way they cancel out. And uh, again, I'm trying to isolate the R. Next, I want to get rid of the 4 pi square. So I'm going to divide by 4 pi square on both sides. So that's gone as well, leaving just the R cube there. Now, I don't want R cube, I want just R. So what am I going to do to get rid of the cube? I'm going to cube root both sides. So my final answer is going to look like this. R is equal to the cube root of G times ME times orbital period squared over 4 pi squared. All right, so that is um, our formula. Now we've isolated the R. Now let's go ahead and start plugging in values into it. Alright, so we're going to begin with plugging in the G. Alright, for G is the universal gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons times meter squared over kilograms squared. ME is the mass of the Earth. Uh, here it is. That I got from the previous table that I showed earlier. So it's 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Next, the orbital period. The orbital period they said is 24 hours. But while doing this type of calculations, you don't use hours. Instead, you use seconds. So we got to go ahead and change it from hours to seconds. So we're going to go ahead and squeeze that here. So we have 24 hours. And in one hour, there's 3,600 seconds. So I multiply. The answer, let me go ahead and get my calculator. 24 times 3600 gives me 86,400 seconds. Alright, so that is my orbital period in seconds. So, write that down. Squared. 
the denominator, we're going to have just 4 pi squared. Alright, so we're going to go ahead and plug in all the numbers on the top. So it's going to be 86,400 squared multiplied times 5.98 times 10 to the 24 times the constant 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. And that gives me uh, 2.97 times 10 to the negative 20 to the positive 24. That's on top. Now I'm going to go ahead and divide it by 4 pi square. So divided by, open parentheses, 4 times 3.14 pi squared, close my parentheses. That gives me, inside of the radical, it is 7.55 times 10 to the 22. Now I'm going to go ahead and do the cube root of the whole answer. And um, that's going to go ahead and give me my final answer. So that's going to go ahead and give me the following. 42, I'm sorry, 42, 6, 4, 2, 7, 5, Nine. So it's 42 million 264,759 meters. All right, so the, the final answer is in meters. Now, likely you won't see anything like this on the, on, the, on the AP test. What they'll actually do is they'll give you this answer in scientific notation. So we're going to move the decimal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 times. So we can round it up slightly to be 4.23 times 10 to the 7 meters. That's more likely. You won't see that big giant number. It will likely be in scientific notation as you see it right there. 4.23 times 10 to the 7 meters from the center of planet Earth. All right. In part B, they ask you guys, what is the orbital speed of the satellite? So now we're going to go to the top formula. In the top formula, which is v equals 2 pi times r, we do have the r right here. So this is part a. Part b, formula, velocity, or the speed, orbital speed, is 2 multiplied times pi multiplied times our r, 4.23 times 10 to the 7 meters, and divided by the orbital period. The orbital period period in seconds is 86,400 seconds. All right, and we're going to go ahead and do that. Times 2 times pi divided by the orbital period of 86,400 seconds. And it gives us an answer of 3,072 meters per second. And that is its velocity, so every second it travels over 3 kilometers, which is very fast. All right, so that is our answer for problem number three. One more time. The radius was 4.23 times 10 to the 7 meters, and the velocity was 3,700, I'm sorry, 3,072 meters per second for the satellite. All right. Up next for us is problem number seven. In this problem, they state the following. It says, if the satellite from the previous problem was placed in orbit, at an orbit that is three times as far away from the center of the planet, about how long would it take to orbit Earth once? And they want the answer in days. All right, so let's start with this. This is the previous answer, which is the radius for the previous problem. Now they said, we're going to put it three times as far away. So I want to get it and multiply by three. And here we go. That will be our new radius. So I want to know, now that we have it further away, how long is it going to take it to circle around planet Earth? So we're going to use this formula to figure out the period, the orbital period for a satellite. Now I'm going to modify it slightly and because uh, I just want t, not t square, so I'm going to square root on both sides. So I'm going to end up with this formula and uh, notice mass of the earth there because it, this satellite is circling around earth and the whole thing is square rooted because I square rooted both sides so I can isolate the t, I didn't want t square. Alright, now we have our formula, let's go ahead and start plugging in values. t is equal to 4, multiply times pi squared, multiply times the radius, 1.27 times 10 to the 8 meters. And notice that it is cubed. And that is divided by g, which is a constant, universal gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons times meters squared over kilograms squared. And that multiplies times the mass of the Earth. Here it is. And we have 
times 10 to 24 kilograms. And the whole thing is square rooted. All right, now solving this with your calculator, I personally tell my students, multiply everything on the top, multiply everything on the bottom, then divide. Uh, if you try to do it all in one step, I'm sure a lot of you guys could, but there's also, it increases the chance for a mistake somewhere. All right, I'm going to begin with the exponent right here, 1.27 times 10 to the 8, and I'm going to go ahead and cube it, multiply times 3.14, which is squared, and then times 4, and it gives me the following value, 8.08 times 10 to the 25, that's my numerator. Okay, for my denominator, just multiply both of these numbers, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, times 5.98 times 10 to the 24, and that gives me 3.99 times 10 to the 14. Next, I'm going to go ahead and divide both of these, and then I'm going to square root them, and that's going to go ahead and give me the orbital period. So it's going to be 8.08 .08 times 10 to the 25 divided by uh, 3.99 times 10 to the 14. It gives me 2.02 .02 times 10 to the 11. Now I'm going to square root that answer. And the final answer, it is 45,000 seconds. 45,082 seconds. All right, so this is our answer in seconds. The problem did specify we want the answer in days. All right, so we got to do a little bit more work. All right, so we're going to get this answer now. I'm going to first switch it to hours, and uh, hours, then we'll switch it to days. All right, so one hour has 3,600 seconds. And then we're going to say, well, one day has 24 hours. Okay, so let's do that. Divided by 3,600, then divided by 24. It gives us 5.2. So it's approximately 5.2 days. That will be the new orbital period of the satellite that is three times as far away as in the previous problem. Up next for us is problem number eight. And in this problem, they ask you guys the following question Mars rotates on its axis once every 1.02 days, almost the same as Earth. Find the distance from the center of Mars at which a satellite will remain in one spot over the Martian surface. Part B, they also want you guys to find the speed of the satellite. All right, now given to us, also I picked it up from the table, is the mass of Mars. So I have MM, is mass of Mars, 6.42 times 10 to the 23. And again, they want us to know the distance from the center of the planet. So we're looking for the radius. Okay, uh, it is this formula again, which we rearrange as I have shown previously. So now let's go ahead and start plugging in the values. So R is equal to the cube root of g, the universal gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to negative 11 uh, newtons times meters squared over kilograms squared multiply times the mass of Mars, here it is 6.42 times 10 to the 23 kilograms and you're going to go ahead and multiply it now times the orbital period of Mars which is about 1.02 times longer than that of Earth. Now, for Earth, the orbital period was 24 hours times 3600, so it's 86,400 seconds. But we want the orbital period of Mars, which is 1.02 times longer, so I'm going to get that and multiply times 1.02, and so it gives you 88,128 seconds. So that's it. Time to complete one revolution. So 88,128 seconds. And that is squared, that's part of the formula. On the denominator is just 4 pi squared. Alright, so now I'm going to go ahead and multiply all these three values. Then I'll do the denominator, then I'll divide, and then I'll do the cube root. I prefer to do it one step at a time. Alright, so I'm going to 88,128 squared, multiply times the mass of Mars, uh, 6.42 times 10 to the 23 kilograms. Multiply times the constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. And that gives me a value of 3.33 times 10 to the 23. Okay, that's the numerator. The denominator is just pi squared times 4. 
gives you 39.4. And all of that, I gotta get the cube root to get my answer. So I'm gonna divide, then get the cube root, and that will give us our answer. 23 divided by 39.4. So we divide that, and now cube root. All right, our answer is the radius to zero three six two nine nine five meters twenty million three hundred sixty two thousand nine hundred and ninety five meters again likely in scientific notation um, that they're not going to give you this big answer it will likely be in scientific notation so I'm going to put an R in scientific notation with decimal one two three four five six seven times two point oh three times ten to the seven meters and that's likely what you're looking at. Maybe round off that three, it's got a six afterwards. I want to round that off to a four. All right, so there's our answer for the radius from the center of the planet. Next question, find the speed of the satellite. Again, we go back to this formula right there. So it's going to be just two times pi times r divided by the orbital period. So we're going to put that here. So we're going to two multiply times 3.14 times the R, which we just got right here, 2.04 times 10 to the 7 meters. All of it divided by the orbital period, which was 88,128 seconds. So our speed, orbital speed, will be times 3.14 times 2 divided by 88,128. Uh, 1,000. 451 meters per second. All right, so that will be part B, and this is part A for problem number eight. Up next for us is problem number nine, and in this problem, they ask you guys the following question. Suppose an asteroid has a semi-major axis of 4 AU. Remember, an AU is an astronomical unit. It is the distance from planet Earth to the sun. So this asteroid has a distance that is four times greater than that. How long does it take the asteroid to go all the way around the sun? So you have our options A, B, C, D, two, four, six, or eight years. So because you're dealing with astronomical units in years, you can go ahead and use the simplified version of this formula. All right, now I'm solving for the amount of time it takes so for, to complete one revolution. So I don't want T squared, I just want T. So how do I get rid of it? I square root both sides. So that's going to end up looking like this, 3 over 2. All right, so now we have it, A. Now the A is 4. So I'm going to go ahead and put 4 to the 2 third power. All right, 4 to the 2 third power. How do you put that in your calculator? Well, the easiest way would be just, what is 2 thirds? It is 4 to the 1.5 power. All right, so you put that in your calculator, so we're going to put 4 carat 1.5, and that'll give us an answer of 8. So the answer is letter D, 8 years. That's how long it will take this um, asteroid to go ahead and circle the sun one time. It will take 8 years. Our next section deals with the writing formulas. The writing formulas is an essential skill that every student needs to have. So we're going to go ahead and practice this a little bit. So in this problem, they go ahead and they give us the following. It says they write the formula for the speed of an object that is going in a circular path. So here we have our objects going in a circular path. This is the formula we want to derive, and this is our starting formula. If this formula is just the speed equals the distance it's traveled over the time it traveled. All right, now, the distance the object travels in a circular path, well, that is the circumference of a circle. So the distance, we can go ahead and replace it with the formula for circumference, which is 2 pi r. So I'm going to put the speed equals to the circumference, 2 pi r, over the time. The time it takes it to go around once, one revolution, that's known as the period. So I'm going to put the symbol for the period, and that is t. So that's our first derivation for that formula. Problem 11 asks you guys the following question. Derive the formula V equals uh, square root of R times G from force equals mass times acceleration. Now they do give us a hint. The hint is the following. It says centripetal acceleration is a velocity square over the radius. So pretend that we have an object circling 
around, so like a planet, and uh, what are the forces acting on it? Picture that. So you have the sun there, and you have a planet going around the sun. What are the forces acting on that planet? There's only one force acting on it. That is gravity. Alright, so gravity is going to be acting on it. So, for the formula, which is a force net is equal to the mass times acceleration. First, let's talk about the force net. It's only gravity. So, I'm going to go ahead and substitute it. Instead of putting Fg, I'm just going to put mass times gravity. And on the other side, I'm going to put mass times acceleration, but it's centripetal acceleration that this object is experiencing. So, that centripetal acceleration is calculated using this formula, v squared equals r, oh, v squared over r. Alright, so there you go, I substituted. Now my goal is to isolate the r. That's what I want to go ahead and do. So I'm going to multiply by r on both sides. So that goes ahead and cancels that out. And uh, so that's gone, giving me the following formula. Next, uh, I'm going to go ahead and divide by m on both sides. And that's gone, giving me rg equals velocity square. And the final step, I just want the velocity, I don't want velocity square. So to get rid of the square, I square root. And there's my answer, square root of r times g. And there's our derivation for an object spinning around in orbit for its velocity. In problem 12, they ask you to figure out an equation for how fast can a car travel as it's making a turn without skidding. So here's your car, it's making a very sharp turn. How fast could it possibly travel before it starts skidding and fly off the road? Alright, so here's the formula that we want. Velocity of the car is equal to the radius of the circle times the coefficient of kinetic friction of the floor and the tires times gravity and then you get the square root of that. The starting formula is going to be the force uh, net equals mass times acceleration. Alright, so let's talk about the car a little bit. Forces acting on the car. Of course, we got force of gravity down here. And opposing that is force normal. And uh, the other force that's keeping the car here is going to be force friction. So force friction is the one that is acting on this vehicle. Now, force normal and force Gravity cancel each other out, so our net force is really just force friction. So I'm going to substitute that here. Force friction is equal to mass times acceleration. And it is centripetal acceleration because it is going around in a circle, so it does have centripetal acceleration, even though it's probably likely going at a constant speed. Alright, so now let's go ahead and continue substituting. I know centripetal acceleration is velocity squared over r, so I'm going to go ahead and substitute that. And for frictional force is the constant times normal force. So I'm going to substitute that. Alright. Next, how do we get uh, normal force? What is normal force? Normal force is equal in magnitude to the force of gravity, which is mass times gravity. Alright. And uh, what's up next after that? Well, now we got all the components that we need. Now we just need to isolate the velocity. So notice though that the m will cancel out on both sides. And then I'm going to multiply by r. So it can cancel that one out. Giving me v squared equals r times the constant times g. After that, I want just the v by itself. Get rid of the square. So I square root on both sides. So that gives me r times constant times g. Square root of that equals the velocity of the car that that's the maximum velocity it could travel before it begins to skid and maybe come off the road. So that is problem number 12. Problem 13 asks you as the following. They ask you to derive the formula of, uh, for an object spinning inside a system and they want specifically the normal force experience as this person spinning perhaps inside of a carnival ride and how much normal force will they experience as their back is against that cylinder that they're spinning in. So what the normal force to derive this formula from the Newton's second law. Alright, so for this one, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what forces are acting on this person. So here's my drawing. So we got the cylinder um, carnival ride and here's our person and they are pinned against the wall. There are three forces acting on this person. 
one you can easily guess it is uh, mass times gravity that's force gravity the next one is normal force normal force uh, yeah and normal force is a contact force so this person their back is making contact against the the carnival right so it is the normal forces going out so what cancels out um, mass times gravity force gravity that will actually be friction friction will cancel it out if friction is the same in magnitude then that person will remain uh, stuck to the wall and they will not slide down so the question is how much normal force will they experience so mass and friction cancel each other out force of gravity and friction the only one left over is force normal I'm going to put that down, force normal equals m and centripetal acceleration, it is velocity square over radius and that is a formula for problem number 13. Next is problem number 14 and in this problem they want you guys to go ahead and figure out this formula for the period of a rotating object in particularly that coin right there how fast can we get this object to spin without the coin flying off so that's what we'll be looking at. So we're going to use, of course, Newton's second law to derive this formula right there. And uh, we're also going to need a couple of formulas. This is the first one we derived when we started deriving equations for the velocity of a rotating object, force of friction, and centripetal acceleration. So let's go ahead and get to work. First of all, let's take a look at the three forces that are acting on this system. Um, for the coin, it is force of gravity, mass times gravity, force normals acting on it and there's one more force friction and uh, gravity and normal will cancel each other out so my net force the only one left over is this force friction now I'm going to go ahead and substitute the uh, acceleration which is velocity squared over r now let's talk about force friction now force friction is this formula the coefficient times force normal Force normal, though, is really matching in magnitude to force of gravity. So I'm going to write this down. The constant times mass times gravity, that's really force normal right there, mass times gravity, is equal to mass times velocity squared over the r. Next, I want to go ahead and isolate the v, so I'm going to go ahead and multiply by r on both sides. And I do notice that the m cancels out. Multiply by r on both sides, so it's r times the constant times g is equal to velocity squared. Next, I'm going to go ahead and substitute this uh, formula for the velocity square. Alright, and that's going to go ahead and give us 2 pi r over the period squared. Alright, so now after we square all of this, we're going to go ahead and end up with the following. r times the constant times gravity equals 4 pi squared r square over period square so that's our formula we're almost towards the end we almost have a formula let me give ourselves a little bit more space next uh, I want to go ahead and move the t over here and uh, so that way we can begin to isolate it now I want to go ahead and divide by r times the constant times g so that way we can really isolate that t so that's gone. And also notice, here's r squared, which is really r squared is r times r, but we already have one r in the denominator, so that's gone. So we end up with this t squared is equal to 4 pi r over the constant times g. And there is our formula for problem number 14. If you want to take a step further, I just want the period, not period square. So you can go ahead and say, well, I'm just going to go ahead and square root both sides and that's taking it a step further so you can truly isolate the period for this formula. That's problem number 14. Problem 15 asks us to go ahead and derive a formula for the period of one of Jupiter's moons as it spins around Jupiter. So they want us to go ahead and also use the formula for gravity and uh, so we're gonna go ahead and take this formula and turn it into that. Alright, so Let's go ahead and begin. So we got Jupiter right there, and uh, there's a much better picture of it, and here's all of its cloud formation. All right, and we have one of its moons, and what is the only force acting on this formula? All right, so it will, it's going to go ahead and be the force of gravity. That's it. So that's just a net force. It's only one force acting on it, the planet pulling on it. 
All right, so I can say that the net force is equal mass times acceleration. So I'm going to go ahead and substitute that in. Mj is the mass of Jupiter. Mm is the mass of its moon, r squared. All right, next we're going to go ahead and substitute. Uh, centripetal acceleration is velocity squared over r. So I'm going to go ahead and substitute that in. So the mass, it's equal to velocity squared over r, and that mass refers to the mass of the moon that we're dealing with. On the other side, it's going to be mass of Jupiter times the mass of the moon over the radius squared. All right, next, there's some things we can go ahead and cancel out. Notice on both sides you have mass of the moon, so we can go ahead and cancel that out. And uh, also on both sides you have r and r, but that one's r squared. So remember, r squared just really means radius times radius. So I'm going to take away one radius from here and one radius from there. So all that we got left over is v squared equals g times the mass of Jupiter over its radius. All right, so now we're getting close. Let's go ahead and continue. Uh, velocity. This was the first formula we derived. Velocity is the um, 2 pi r, which is the circumference divided by the orbital period. So that's the formula. We're going to go ahead and substitute it here. Again, I need the space, so I'm just going to go ahead and erase these and put that there. So it was going to be 2 pi r over the orbital period, and this whole thing was squared. It's equal to g times the mass of Jupiter over its radius. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and square this. It's going to be 4 pi squared times r squared over the orbital period. It's equal to g times mass of Jupiter over its radius. Uh, notice that, again, I have two radius. I can cancel this one with that one. Give me just one r. Now, uh, my goal is going to go ahead and be to that one that's squared. My goal is going to be to isolate this t. So I'm going to multiply both sides by t squared. Okay, so that cancels with that, but notice now I got a t squared on this side. And on this side, I'm going to go ahead and divide by g times mj. Do the same on the other side. So cancel out the g, mass of Jupiter. So that gives me this formula. t squared is equal to 4 pi squared times r over g times mass of Jupiter, mj. Again, if you want to take it a step further, I just want t instead of t squared. I want the orbital period. I would square root both sides. So give me this formula. 4 pi squared times r over g times mj. That will be our answer for problem number 15. We even This is actually our answer. We took it a step further just to isolate that period. All right, so that brings us to problem 15, the, the answer. We're also finished with the... Uh, this week, week 12 of AP Physics, and this also brings us to the end of Unit 3 for AP Physics. Thank you so much for watching.